All right, everyone, welcome to class. This is CDA 3201, and if that's the class you were looking for, then congratulations, you're in the right place. If it's not the class that you were looking for, well, you know, it's a good class, so what the heck, I say let's go ahead and take it. So give me a second here, let me go ahead and do a little bit of sharing, and we will get this show on the road. In the lobby so we will admit that person give me a second to turn off my video because what happens all too often so when i have my video on slides start to lag and that makes everybody sort of sad fantastic all right let's get started shall we all right so what is this uh, cda 3201 the title of the class is computer logic and design whatever that actually means I mean, I sort of recognize the words. I sort of get them, but I don't quite know what that means. I, I don't like that title. I think we need a new title for the class. All right, well, I guess we should be based on what we're actually doing in the class, right? Well, what would we call the class? Well, I say, let's call the class how to build computers from the ground up. I mean, because ultimately, that's basically what we're going to be doing in this class. We're going to be diving, and I do say deep, because I mean deep, deep, deep into computers. And we're gonna understand literally how they do what they do. I mean, we're down in the belly of the beast. So I say, hey, this is a better title, how to build computers from the ground up. All right, got that taken care of. Let's move on and see what else we have to cover today. Boop. All right, so I am Dr. Jim Anderson, hello. You can reach me via my mobile phone number there, but eh, better to get in touch with me via email jmanderson at usf.edu. Um, I will have office hours for this class, and basically it's an hour before class. Okay, it's 11.45 because I got to go change before I get ready for class, but whatever, you get the gist of it. 10.45 to 11.45 before class. Those are my office hours twice a week on Tuesday and Thursday. Good news, I do have an office on campus. Bad news, I haven't been there for a year. <laughs> so my office hours are going to be on Teams. I have set up a separate Teams channel just for office hours, so if you need to find me, it's pretty easy to find me. All right? So we got that taken care of. Good news. We're actually very, very, uh, I guess, blessed. Let's go with that. Blessed in this class. We've got two TAs. It's a real gift from the university. We've got Dennis and we've got Pi. Okay. And Dennis and Pi are both reachable via their emails. And they both set up office hours to provide you with the support that you will probably need for this class as you get overwhelmed with a ton of information that I will be sharing with you, all right? So two TAs are standing by to make sure that you're gonna be successful in this class. And of course, I'm here too. So you've got three people who are willing to work with you to make you be successful in this class. I mean, let's agree, there's almost no possible way you can't be successful if that many people are pushing for you. Let's just agree on that, shall we? All right, so we'll discuss a lot of things in this class. You have a lot of homeworks and stuff like that. You got stuff going on. I mean, it can get to be a little bit much, but good news, there's TAs and there's Dr. Anderson and all that stuff like that. But something I wanna remind you about, you also have everybody else in the class. Now, if we were in a classroom, you'd be sitting next to somebody, you could turn to them and go, hey, I don't get this. Can you explain it to me? And they could probably explain it to you. Well, we're online, so we sort of can't do that. Thank you very much. However, in that fabulous tool that we like to call Canvas, there is an option called discussions. And if you get stuck on something, ask the class. You can go to discussions, post your question, and get somebody in the class who's probably dealing with the exact same issue. Maybe they got an answer. They can answer you, and they probably can do it quicker than the TAs or I can get to you, right? So you've got yet another, a fourth option for getting information about how to accomplish everything that you need to accomplish in this class. Once again, your success is almost guaranteed at this particular point in time, right? A little bit about Dr. Anderson. So right now you're attending USF. Congratulations on that. You're hoping to get a degree. And man, we're pushing for that. That's what the purpose for taking this class is. We're gonna get you another three credits, gonna move you closer to your goal. That's fantastic. Once upon a time, I was in your shoes. I went to school to get a degree. 
So I went to a university called Washington University in St. Louis, and I got myself a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science. Woohoo! Graduated, and I was out, and I was working. Thank you very much. But, you know, after a while, I thought, you know, I know a lot. I'm really, really smart because I got a Bachelor of Science. Thank you very much. But I wanted to know more. So you know exactly what I did. Yep, went back. Went back to Washington University in St. Louis, got a master's degree in computer science, an MSCS. Now I was the smartest person in the room. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, okay, so that's good for, you know, like a while. Time goes on, I find myself in some sort of different situations. Uh, you know, that school thing actually worked out pretty well for me twice. So, oh, what the heck, let's go back. Oh, and back I went to Florida Atlantic University, just down the road from us here. I ended up getting a PhD in computer science. Woohoo! Now we're really smart. Thank you very much. I mean, pretty much, pretty much that's, that's sort of the end of the road. Well, yeah, for most people, but not for me. Why? Well, what did I do? Well, having accomplished three degrees, I decided three is nice, but you know, better so i went back and got an mba in marketing bam so now if there's ever any questions about who the smartest person in the room is <laughs> duh it's me okay obviously and by the way i don't make mistakes i'm actually perfect so if you ever see anything during my presentations that appears to be wrong you're probably wrong i'm perfect i don't make mistakes thank you very much all right so if i'm so good at going to school why aren't i still going to school good question well first off i own two 80 pound boxers okay who require a great deal of my attention so there you go that um, I do have a son who is a senior in high school. You remember high school. It wasn't all that long ago for you, was it, right? Okay, you know how much of an effort it is managing a senior in high school. And just to make it a little bit more complicated, I have a son who's a sophomore working on a computer science degree up at the University of North Florida. So there we go. So my hands are quite full. And as though that wasn't enough, there's also the daughter. But we don't need to talk about the daughter at this point in time. Now, most of the professors that you have here at uh, USF went to school, got degrees, and then went out and got their university teaching job, and they are super smart professors. I mean, I'm really stunned at how smart they are. It's really impressive. My, uh, my journey was a little different. <laughs> I've worked for 17 different companies during my career. Uh, so I've been around the block, as we like to say, a few times. So I know a great deal about getting jobs, working jobs, losing jobs, getting more jobs. <laughs> anyway, so I've done an awful lot of things during quote, quote, my adult life, okay? But the good news for you is that I'm here now. How cool is that? All right, we're taking CDA 3201 over the summer. So what, are, what do we wanna get out of this course? Good question. Well, we want to successfully complete it, so let's go with that. But we also wanna have a, a deep understanding of exactly how digital circuits are built. We want to understand how multiple different input signals can be combined in order to control the creation of different output signals. Inputs come in, outputs go out okay we want to learn not just how to create working circuits because that's actually fairly straightforward but we also want to know how to take it to the next level and create working circuits that have been oh 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 here comes the big word here comes optimized and we want to optimize them to reduce a bunch of different things cost power and potentially even complexity man i like simple stuff so that's got to be a good thing, right? And arguably all the information you learn in this class, you're going to be able to apply to all of the other computer science classes that you take. Boy, that's sort of a tough talk, but OK. So whatever it is that we're going to cover in here is applicable in other places. If I do my job correctly this summer, by the end of the summer, I will have changed the way that you think. That's my goal for the class. So I'm sort of a visual guy. So it's summer semester. Woohoo! All right. Today's the 18th of May. That means class is starting. Yay! You have up until this Friday 
to drop the class. And if you drop the class, I believe you get your money back. Woohoo! Okay. So you'll have this class and also Thursday's class to sort of make up your mind as to whether or not this is how you want to spend your summer. Okay. If you stick it out, we'll probably have a midterm sometime around the middle of June. Okay. July 2nd is your last day to withdraw from the class. And if you withdraw, it doesn't show up on your transcripts, but the university's gonna keep your money. <laughs> Sorry about that. And if you stick with me all the way to the end, then sometime during the first week of August, I don't know, no, I don't think that's right, actually. No, no, I'm gonna, have to, I'm gonna have to make a change. You know, that's interesting because I was perfect. The whole perfect story worked out pretty well, I thought, but I'm not, I'm not happy with that. It turns out that the actually, everything ends during, there you go. I like that a lot better, yes. It'll be during the uh, third week of July, which is actually the 22nd. That's when the class ends. So this class is actually 10 weeks long. We're going to meet twice a week, okay? That means we're, and we're going to meet for roughly about two hours or so. That means we're going to end up spending about 40 hours together over the course of the summer. That is what you're signing up for, okay? Now, 40 hours is an awful lot of time. You're busy. You got other stuff going on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I fully understand how that goes. Should you really show up for like every class? Is it necessary? Good question. The answer is yes. I expect you to show up for every class. Well, why? Why show up for every class? Fair question. Well, you know, either you or somebody is paying for you to take the class, right? Here at the fabulous USF, uh, if you're a resident of the state of Florida, you're paying roughly $183 for every credit hour. This is a three credit hour class. It means you're laying down pretty much 550 bucks for the privilege of taking this class this summer. Cost per class session comes out to be yeah, somewhere in the neighborhood of $19, probably a little bit more because it's summer. Okay, uh, what that means is that if you decide to blow off my class and not come, you are obligated to walk down to a Starbucks, get six of those cafe mochas, walk to the trash can and throw them away. Because effectively that's exactly what you did by blowing off my class. I will know if you're here because I will take roll every class and your attendance will count as part of your grade. So what are we going to do during the 10 weeks that we're going to spend together? Well, thank you very much for asking. Well, a bunch of stuff. OK, we're basically going to be going through the book and covering all the information that's in the book. OK, there will be four separate homework assignments that will be assigned to you. And of course, they will be due. For kicks and grins, we'll have a midterm and for kicks and grins, we'll have a final exam. Bam, there you go. That's it in a nutshell. How's your grade gonna be determined? Well, I like to keep things simple, okay? So there's a maximum of 100 points that you can earn in this class. Homeworks one and two are both gonna be worth five points. Homework three and homework number four are going to be worth 10 points. You're going to be part of a team that does a presentation in class. That'll be worth 10 points. Midterms 25, finals 25. Your attendance counts for five. Remember, that's half a letter grade. Your participation counts for five. That's another half a letter grade. Total it all up, and with a little luck, it's going to come out to be 100 points. Pretty simple stuff. How have I graded in the past? Well, I give out a bunch of A's, a bunch of B's, a bunch of C's, an occasional D. And doggone it, every once in a while I give out an F. Well, why do you give out an F, Dr. Anderson? Well, I give out an F because somebody doesn't show up to take the final exam. I think I just found something else that was wrong. I can't believe it. I don't make mistakes. Uh, that's what, what did I say? I said that was July 2nd, I think. That's much better. All right. So yeah, so if I give a final exam, come on, you got an obligation to show up and take it. Thank you very much. I don't need you to be getting no dang F in my class. Thank you very much. All right. Remember, you got up until July 2nd. 
to withdraw from the class if for whatever reason life turns upside down on you or something like that, okay? Uh, you don't get no cash back, but it doesn't show up in your transcripts. So pff, there we go. All right. So how am I going to organize each class? Well, we're going to talk about the problem. We're going to talk about the solution. And then we're going to talk about how we actually go about using the solution. So rock and roll, that seems like a pretty good way to go about doing things, right? I like it. So let's talk about that attendance thing. All right, so how are we going to do this? Well, each class I'll present a series of slides. Yay, fabulous and wonderful. At some point in time when I'm presenting the slides, there will be a word of the day slide. This is a sample. The word of the day sample is fire truck, and I have trouble with this every single time. The word of the day today is not fire truck. That's why I put sample up there. Sample, sample, sample. This is just an example. Okay, located somewhere in the class's presentation will be a word of the day slide. You're responsible for writing the word of the day down. Then within 20 minutes of the class being over, you're responsible for sending Dennis, and there's his email address, an email that looks like this. It'll have the subject and it'll have the word of the day. That's it. You don't need a body for the email at all. Just shoot that off to him. That's how he's going to know that you were attending class and probably even more importantly, you were paying attention. Now, if you don't send Dennis the email with the word of the day, he's going to mark you as not being in class and you'll be marked as missing the class. And that will, as we like to say in the business, count against you. So really, in all honesty, attendance is up to you. All right. There is a book for this class. It's about digital logic and circuit analysis and design. It's a fabulous and wonderful book. It costs about 50 bucks if you buy the paperback version off of Amazon. Somewhat interestingly, you can get the book for free online at the Internet Archive. And there's the link. Now, the book is actually a good book. And I will be teaching this class from the book. So if you're a book sort of person, I'd suggest that you get it. I think my notes and my presentation are fantastic because I made them. But you may do better, actually, if you have the book. So you're more than welcome to reach out because, of course, it's free and online and snag yourself a copy of the book and just see if that's what's going to make you happy. OK, so you can also call up Amazon and ask them to send you a legit. I can touch it. I can feel it. Paperback copy for about 50 bucks. A couple different ways to skin that cat. But no matter what, we do have a book and it is available to you. By the way, and I apologize because I should have said this right off the bat. Every slide that I present in this class will be made available to you roughly five to 10 minutes after class. I will post it on Canvas and I'll post it on Teams. So all of my slides will be made available to you. So if you need to get that link, you'll get it from the slides. Hey, and I wanted to let, make sure that you guys knew about Suitable. So Suitable is a really cool service offered by um, the university. So what it is, is over in the Marshall Center, there's like a place you can go and it's the Suitable place. And they have suits. So if you're doing like a job interview or you're doing something fancy and either you don't have a suit or you don't have a good suit, they've got, I mean, it's clogged. It's jammed with suits. They've got suits for everybody, every shape, every size. They've got boy suits. They've got girl suits. They've got suits for everybody, man. There's no reason for you to go strolling into an interview or some important event not looking your best, right? And it's free. I understand you just show up and they'll give you a suit for two days and then you return it. So it's really cool service. And if you didn't know about it, you know about it now. I urge you to go over to Marshall Center and check it out and see what they got and just see if this is something that's going to make your life better because it probably will. Already, man, we're only like 10 slides in this thing and you got homework. Dang, how did that happen? So you've got a responsibility to send me an email. So what do you got to do? You got to send an email to me, jmanderson at usf.edu. The subject line has to read CDA 3201 contact information. And that email needs to contain three pieces of information. Your name, your email address, and your mobile phone number. 
I don't want you to ghost me. I don't want you to vanish. I don't want you to be unreachable. So send this information to me. I'll tuck it into my database of knowledge and potentially I'll never use it unless you decide to vanish on me or vanish on the members of your team, at which point in time I'll reach out and say, yo, what up, right? But tag, today's homework for you is to send me an email with your contact information, all right? All right, at the end of the semester, we always give you a quiz. The quiz says, was the professor clear about expectations for performance for the class? And the answer is, yeah, because I presented a whole slide on it. All right, so it's actually pretty easy to be successful in the class. Uh, you're going to have a bunch of tiny design assignments given to you once a week. It really shouldn't take you very long whatsoever to complete them. The reason I'm giving them to you is because during the week, we've covered a bunch of new material. And the whole concept behind the design assignments is to give you a chance to use that material before you hit a homework or a test or something like that to make sure that you understand kind of how all this stuff works. You'll have four homeworks that you'll be given two weeks to complete. You'll be part of a team that delivers an in-class presentation at the end of the semester. And there's a midterm and a final. And arguably, that's it. That's all it takes to be successful in this class. Good news about the design that you have to do is that I'm here and the TAs are here. OK, any question you might have can be answered. OK, we get to time for the midterm and for the final exam. We'll spend a class going over what you need to be studying for the midterm and for the final. To be successful in this class, you simply have to be willing to put the time in. OK, just like for every other class you've ever had, you got to put the time in to get the homeworks done to study what you need to know, to work as part of a team. You do those things and you'll be rocking. Now remember, summer's not that long. <laughs> it's only 10 weeks, okay? So yeah, I'm asking for your time and attention, but good news for you, I'm not asking for it for very long. So let's make sure that you can give me your time and attention for 10 weeks. And if you can do that, you're going to be rocking. You're going to knock this class out of the park. OK. Uh, a couple of disclaimers here. I'm not using my laptop. My laptop's broken for the rest of the semester. I'm going to be using a laptop that I have borrowed from a friend. What that means is I'm not responsible for any material he may have stored on his laptop. My air conditioner has also stopped working, so I'm currently staying at another friend's house. I'm not responsible for anything in the background or any noises that you might hear during the course of a class. I'm not responsible. Let's talk about that COVID-19 thing. Now, it looks like we're starting to turn a corner on it. Yay, fabulous. But it hasn't gone away by any stretch of the imagination. We are living in weird times. Let's all agree on that. Everybody, you, me, everybody, is at a risk of catching COVID-19. Whether or not you're vaccinated or not, you could probably still catch it. You, my young classmates, are especially at risk because you're young and you interact with far too many people. If you become sick in this class, it means that the class will become arguably the least of your concerns. And that's perfectly valid. If you become sick, reach out to me. OK, we'll come up with a plan that allows you to, number one, of course, get healthy because that's the most important thing. And number two, we'll come up with a way to deal with this class. OK, so please don't get sick. <laughs> but if you find yourself getting sick, eh, we'll come up with a plan. I've had a couple students so far come down with COVID-19 during a class and we've worked through it. All right. So if it happens to you, we will work together and we will come up with a plan for dealing with it. All right. That's it for the introductions. Let's take a five minute time out. Stand up, stretch, get a drink, go to the bathroom, do what you gotta do. You've got five minutes and I will see you back here, all right?
All right, I'm back, you're back, we're back. Let's uh, get this show started, shall we? All right. All right, so we got the introductions out of the way. So now it's time to really do some 3201 stuff. Now, just to be real clear about where we currently stand is, let me make sure that I get my story right, because if I don't get my story right, it's just going to be very confusing and fumbling and all that sort of stuff like that. When I talked to the really smart professors here at USF and told them that I was going to be teaching this class, they said, that's fantastic. They said, hey, did you know what they said? They said, um, CDA 3201 is actually part of a sequence. I said, that's so cool. They said, yes, so every student who's going to be in your 3201 class has already had CDA 3103. And I was like, wow. That's cool. So that means they know everything that was in 3103. They said, yes, they'll be coming into your class knowing everything that was in that class. I'm thinking that's fantastic. Although back in the day when I was in school and I took sequence classes, I did not necessarily go into the next class knowing everything that I was supposed to know for the next class. So here's how we're going to play this game. Uh, for the rest of today and for Thursday, what we're going to do is a little bit of, uh, let's call it review, okay? Before we jump in and big the, do the big 3201 stuff and get down into the belly of the beast, let's make sure that you're coming into the class knowing all of the things that you need to know, because it would be awkward if we started doing a bunch of stuff with some assumptions about things that you knew and for whatever reason, you didn't actually know it, okay? So let's do a little bit of review action and then we'll start hitting it hard, okay? Just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Boom. So let's start, shall we? In the book, by the way, this is chapter zero. Boom. Hey, look, it's a computer. <laughs> that happens to be Mac Pro uh, 16. Uh, you can pick it up for the low, low price of about $2,700, really probably $2,800. It's a sophisticated computer, man. It can do a bunch of stuff. And that's cool. But there is a fundamental question. How? How does it do? All the things it does, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm up on the software and all the cool apps. Forget that. Remove all the apps. Hey, even remove the operating system. I can still turn the thing on. It can still talk to its hard drive. It can still display stuff on the screen. It can still read things in through ports and send stuff out through other ports. How does it do all the things that a computer does? And that's a good question. I mean, we sort of take them for granted, right? Maybe we need to go back in time and sort of see how this whole computing thing started. Well, if we're going back in time. Not only are we going back in time, we're going like way back in time. So if we got to go back to like the first, what, computing device? It'd probably be the Abacus, right? Which is, by the way, <laughs> people still use that today. Right place, right time. You're seeing people cranking out abacus. And if you know how to use one, you can blow through math on an abacus really fast. Okay. It was such a good design. It's lasted for three centuries. Well, it's good, but it's not necessarily something we stuck with because everything always advances, right? This gentleman by the name of John Napier came along and he used logarithms, you know, logarithms, right? To create a device that multiplied numbers. And he created the slide rule. Now, <laughs> I'm willing to bet arguably nobody in this class has ever used a slide rule before. You may have seen them, but probably only like in museums or stuff like that. But going back to like, uh, it's like 1960s, this was like engineering required gear. I mean, just like your laptop today, every engineer had a slide rule. And they could whip it out and they could do math super fast. It was a cool tool. It's complicated, sort of, to the uninitiated. 
But all you got to do is slide, line things up, and you got answers right in front of you. So as far as tools, it is pretty cool and pretty simple, right? Life moves on. Blaise Pascal, he created an adding machine, basically a calculator. And considering when he lived, it was pretty darn sophisticated stuff. And it's not something you're necessarily going to be cranking out a hundred of or anything like that, but he made one and it it did what it was supposed to do. It could add. Hmm. Computer start, right? Peter Babbage, now he's famous, okay? He made a difference engine to evaluate polynomials. Now, Babbage also dreamed up modern computers. He was able to envision what a modern computer would be, but computers were not built during his lifetime because basically we couldn't machine them. The ability to make the parts that would have been required for the computer that he dreamed up, it just wasn't possible to do during his lifetime. And because of that, it never happened. Now, A's computers are pretty amazing things, but they didn't just drop from the sky. Some smart people had to have some smart ideas before we could have the computers that we have today. Okay. In the 1930s, arguably the first, uh, let's call it real computer, it was actually an automatic calculator. Okay. You know what a calculator is. Basically, this is exactly what this thing was. It started down a big scale. Okay. But it was the first one that was ever built. And what was it used for? Interestingly enough, artillery ballistic calculations. You know, shoot a missile, it goes up in the air, it comes down. Question is, where was it going to come down? And you can figure it out based on what wind speed, uh, angle, uh, perhaps the weight of the shell, a bunch of different inputs and stuff like that. Calculate it, bam, you get an answer out. People could do it by hand, but it took a long time. So they created this massive machine basically to crank out the answers, right? Pretty impressive. Moving on, we got to ENIAC. And ENIAC is sort of our first for real computer because it was actually programmable. The Mark I was pretty much, you got what you got. ENIAC, you could actually program it. If you take a look at the picture in the lower left-hand corner, you see those wires sticking into the front? The wires were really the program. Depending on what parts of this machine you connected to what other parts of the machine, that was the program you were going to run. It used eight 18,000 vacuum tubes. <laughs> what that meant was it needed a lot of juice. It had a big electrical port going into the back of it. And 18,000 vacuum tubes, a ton of those are going to be failing every day, right? And you programmed it by pushing things into the front, connecting wires. Not quite the way we do programming today, but eh, that's how it started. And arguably, that's how people viewed programming at that point in time, right? You just needed to make more places where you could push wires in and you could have a more sophisticated program. Things, of course, got better. It got better first with Mr. John von Neumann, super famous dude. Now, he did a lot of, I think he did a lot of stuff like the Manhattan Project and stuff like that. But one of his real breakthrough ideas was he was like, hey, why don't you stick a program in the computer's memory? Because if you did that, you could change it all you wanted. And when he had that idea, the whole ENIAC where you plug things in, that idea went away. And you and I look at this and we go, duh, of course you put a computer program in memory. <laughs> Doesn't everybody know that? And the answer is no, nobody knew that. So John von Neumann had a breakthrough idea of actually storing computer programs in memory. And when he had the idea, it was a big idea. That was good, but that wasn't going to get us to quite where we needed to get to. We needed a little help. And that's where Brandine, Bratton, and Shockley came along. Three guys working at at t Bell Labs, they invented the transistor. And there's a picture of the original transistor to the right of that picture. Ugly little thing, huge, gigantic, awkward, okay? But when they came up with it, they had came up with a way to reduce the power and the size requirement of vacuum tubes. And there's a picture of an actual transistor that you can buy today 
right next to the text there. They're tiny, okay? But once you had a transistor, you didn't need a vacuum tube. You didn't need all the power that went into a vacuum tube. And transistors basically don't fail. Oh my gosh. So life changed. So we now knew that we could put computer programs into computer memory, huge breakthrough. Now we had a transistor so we could get rid of all those vacuum tubes. Breakthrough number two, we just needed one more breakthrough. Mr. J.W. Foster got it for us. He came up with the magnetic core memory. And once he came up with that, all of a sudden we had all the memory that we needed for our computers. We could put that program into the computer's memory and we could put data into the computer's memory at the same time because we had enough memory. You know that laptop that you buy that has eight gig of memory on it? J.W. Forrester came up with that memory. He invented the concept of a solid state memory, magnetic core. It could be used in a computer. So these three ideas, stick a program in memory, transistor to reduce size of everything, and oh, by the way, magnetic core memory, are the three ideas that actually led to your laptop. There's basically been four generations of computers. The first one, our buddy ENIAC, remember, programmed by putting plugs into different holes. Second generation was in the 1950s or so. They were smaller, they were faster, and they started to use transistors. Woohoo, we're moving along now. Then came the 60s and the 70s. They invented something called mini computers, which were actually much smaller than all the previous ones. And you could put them in industrial and research labs, potentially a factory. All of a sudden, they didn't have to be in a big honking sealed room. And then, of course, we get to the fourth generation. And these are basically computers that are built using VLSI technology or a zillion billion transistors crammed onto a single chip, which is basically what VLSI is. All right. There's probably going to be a fifth generation. We just don't quite know where or when it's going to happen. OK, but we're probably living in the fourth generation right now. Evolution of the microprocessor, you've probably seen things like this before. So where do we sort of start with this? Well, calculations per second is on the left, and obviously time is on the bottom. So eh, about 1960s or so is roughly when IBM came up with uh, their sort of initial chips that could do a certain number of calculations per second. Uh, not that many necessarily, a couple thousand calculations per second. We move on, Apple II showing up uh, mid 70s or so. It can do uh, uh, about 10 to the two calculations per second. IBM PC is sort of in there at the same time. You can see the Pentiums up there uh, about 1995 or so. What, maybe about 10 to the six calculations per second. That's pretty good. Today, you go out and buy a laptop, there's a good chance you're going to get like an i7 or a Raisin on it or something like that. And they're kissing oh, 10 to the 11 or something like that as far as operations per second. That's pretty good. That's pretty close to mouse brain <laughs> processing capabilities. Human brains, because we're so great and fabulous, is somewhere what in the neighborhood about 10 to the 15 calculations per second. We got a little room. We got a little bit of room on these uh, these. Uh, uh, microprocessors, but you know, they've been making a lot of progress. They're going to catch up with us eventually. But the core thing here is, of course, that microprocessors have been getting faster and faster and smaller and smaller over time. And we anticipate that this trend will continue. So what changed everything for computers? Well, you know, short answer is the IBM PC and the Apple II because what happened was all of a sudden you could have a computer at home. It no longer had to be something special that was only found in a lab or in a factory. And when the Apple II and the IBM PC came out, boom, the world exploded. Suddenly everybody had PCs, suddenly everybody was programming, suddenly programs became available. 
Uh, what was the most popular program when the Apple II came out? Uh, 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 it was, it was, it was. It was a program called VisiCalc, which was effectively an early version of Excel. People thought it was the cat's meow. Rows, columns, add numbers automatically? Yes. <laughs> it was a big deal back in the day. Note that the Apple has uh, two floppy drives that you could plug in. It did not necessarily come with a floppy drive. You might be saving stuff to tape back in the day. Oh my goodness, we have come so far. All right, so there's different types of computing systems that you can build. You can build digital computing systems. You can also build analog systems. What's the diff? Well, so a digital system, okay, is a system in which information is represented and processed in discrete quantities. Something is either on or it's off. And we see a pulse there, right? It's going between five volts and zero volts. And either it's five volts or else it's zero volts. And there is literally no in between. And that is considered to be a digital system. And it contrasts with an analog system. An analog system can take on a range of values between two values. So between zero and 120, and between zero and negative 120, you can have any one of those values at any given point in time, okay? And yes, they do make analog computers. <laughs> okay, they're not as popular as digital computers, but they do exist. So if we could go digital or analog, why go digital? Good question. So analog computers and other analog systems were in use long before digital devices got perfected, okay? But digital systems have pretty much won. Mm, why? Well, digital techniques are more easy to program. Digital circuits are faster than analog circuits. Numeric information can be represented digitally with greater precision and greater range than you can do with analog signals. Information storage and retrieval functions are a heck of a lot easier to do if you do them in digital form rather than analog, right? So I put a bunch of zeros and ones on a spinning floppy drive is fine. Putting an audio signal onto a tape is also another way I could store information, but it's a lot slower. And digital techniques allow built-in error detection and correction mechanisms. And you don't get that with your analog storage techniques. Systems also lend themselves to miniaturization much more than analog systems do. You might be able to do the same thing with an analog system, but it's probably going to be larger. Great, I've decided I want to design a digital system. How am I going to go about doing that? Well, it's simple. Look, here you go. Got some inputs, put it into something. It's going to process it. Boom, it's going to kick out an output. Effectively, that's this class in a nutshell. Thank you very much. We're done, we're finished, and we will now have our final exam. Uh, stop, stop, stop. That's at the system level, or as we like to say, the highest level. What happens if we dive in a little bit? If we dive in, we see that there's a lot more going on in there. Yeah, there's inputs, but the inputs are coming into what's called an adder, which will then go into register A, and register A may then feed back into the adder, or else it might actually produce an output. Meanwhile, there's two control signals that come into register A. I can clear it out, or I can cause register A to be stored somewhere else. All right, so there's more detail at the register level than there was at the system level, right? Is that as low as we can go? I don't think so. Boom, gate level. So I can realize the register level in terms of, of a number of different gates. In the gates, I've got X1 through X5. I've got five different inputs coming into this. What? Did I just lose my PowerPoint? Did? No. There it is. Okay, it's back. Sorry. Um, I got five different inputs coming in. And it's going through what? Six different gates each one of them doing potentially something different based on the signals that were presented to it. And coming out of gate six effectively is the result or the function value for X1 through X5. All right, so that's as low as we can go, right? 
Well, you would think so. Maybe not. Maybe we can go even lower. I don't know. I can get my act together here. Damn. We can. We can actually go down to the physical design level where we say, hey, if I want to implement these six gates, I'm going to have to use some transistors, some physical design, and actually implement that design on a circuit board. Chink, chink. So, digital design exists at multiple different levels. So, how do you build a digital computer? Well, good news. Guess what? There's really only sort of four parts to the whole thing, right? Potentially, there's some input and output devices, maybe a keyboard, maybe a monitor, maybe something like that. There's some memory, and in that memory, you're going to store both your code and your data. Inside of the computer, there's two primary components. There's a control unit that's running the show, and then there's an arithmetic logic unit, or an ALU, which actually is responsible for processing all of the commands and all of the data. The control unit makes sure that the ALU gets the next instruction and the associated data. The ALU processes it, and the control unit gets the next and the next and the next and the next. And ultimately, that's the high level organization of every single digital computer out there. Oh, instruction cycle of a digital computer. So what's your laptop actually doing? Well, it's pretty simple. Very first thing it does is it fetches the next instruction of the current program from memory into the control unit. So I'm playing Fortnite, fabulous. Grab the next instruction of Fortnite, okay? From memory, stick it into the control unit. Decode the instruction, okay? Basically determine what machine instruction is then to be executed. Throw X. Then fetch any operands that are needed for that instruction from a memory or from an input device. Okay, great. So my little instruction that I'm currently processing now needs some stuff to work on, so it's going to get it. Perform the operation. All right, so I got my operation. I got all the data. Now do it. Add, subtract, shift, whatever the heck I'm going to do. And then store in memory any results generated by the operation or send the results to an output device. And rinse and repeat. Fetch, decode, fetch, perform, store, do over. And that's what your laptop is doing a zillion times a second, all the time, those five steps. Hmm, computer instructions. So, as the control unit of a computer fetches instruction for memory for execution, all sorts of different types of operations can result. Hmm, what kind of operations? Well, good question. Well, you can have math instructions. You can add, subtract, multiply, divide. Okay, we know about those. What else can you do? Well, good question. Test and compare. Is something bigger than? Is it less than? Is it equal to? So you can check two things against each other. That's something else your computer can do. You can branch or skip. I am here, and my next instruction will be there. So I can jump ahead. I can jump back. I can change the control of my program based on what's going on. In Apple commands, I can read from a port. I can write to a port. I can read from a screen. I can write to a screen. And finally, logic and shifting operations. Okay, I have the ability to do ands and ors and nors. I have the ability to shift binary values to the left or to the right, which is effectively like multiplying them. I can manipulate bits. That's it. Those are the five things that any CPU can do. And really, that's all they can do. They might have 100 different flavors for how they do these things but they can really only do five things. All right, we've got my fabulous and wonderful computer. I've got a ton of information. I want to put my information into my computer. How am I gonna do that? I'm gonna push really hard. Information in computer can generally be divided into one of three different categories. 
numbers, we like numbers, things that are not numbers, <laughs> and instructions for the CPU. So data comes in two different flavors, right? Numbers and non-numeric, and then we've got instructions, code. Numeric data representation stored in the computer's memory in a binary, base two numbering system. Non-numeric, okay, used to store encoding of text. We think use things like ASCII or Unicode to encode all that stuff that's on your keyboard, right? Every single character on your keyboard has a secret ASCII or Unicode code for it. And if you send that ASCII or Unicode to uh, the CPU, potentially it's gonna go, oh, hey, I see that number. I know that's a capital A and I will do something with the capital A, right? Instruction codes are basically uh, codes as far as what you want the CPU to do. They're broken down into subfields to say, this is the instruction, here's uh, operand one, here's operand two, do something with the two operands. Ooh, control unit, the control unit, part of a CPU follows a stored list of instructions stored in the memory, directing the activities of the arithmetic unit and any of the output, output, input output devices until the program is done. Each unit performs its task under the synchronizing influence of a control unit. The control unit's the boss. It tells the CPU what it's gonna do now and what it's gonna do next. Ah, the arithmetic, arithmetic logic unit, or ALU. Most ALUs support operations on integers, because we like integers, they're pretty simple to use, okay? Typical ALU uh, operations include adding, add, subtract, multiply, divide. We can do ands and ors. We can shift and rotate data. And if we really wanted to get crazy, we can convert data from one type to another from binary to hex, from hex to octal, from octal to ASCII, we can sort of do anything we want, right? Memory, all right, let's talk about memory. Gotta store the stuff someplace, right? Well, computer memory units are classified as primary memory if they can be accessed directly by the control unit. Otherwise, if you have to go through an intermediary, they're called secondary memory. Primary memory consists of RAMs, which is random access memory, or ROMs, which is read-only memory, basically memory that cannot be changed. Concept of a memory address for a memory cell is the same concept as like a number for a post office box, right? Every post office has a whole bunch of rows of mailboxes, each identified by a unique number. Same thing with memory locations. Each memory cell resides in a unique numbered position, and the number being basically its memory address. So every memory location sort of has two characteristics, an address, okay, and a content. That's how we can store our program. That's how we can store our data in the random access memory. Memory units can be characterized by their access and cycle times. Memory access time is the length of time required to extract or to read a word from the memory, access time. Cycle time may be defined as the minimum interval of time required between successive memory operations. So the delay between reading once and reading twice. Access time of a memory determines how quickly information can be obtained by the CPU, whereas the cycle time determines the rate at which successive memory accesses may be made. Secondary memory devices are used for bulk or mass storage of programs and data, including things like hard drives or uh, DVDs. In contrast to primary memory, information on secondary devices is not accessed directly. We need to go through probably some software to get access to it. Special controller searches the device to locate the block of information containing the desired item, and then reads it in, probably in a big whoosh.
found, the entire block is usually transferred into primary memory where the desired items can be accessed in a more convenient fashion. Boom! There you go. It's our word of the day. The word of the day today is, of course, cupcake. And remember what that actually means. What it means is that you're on the hook to reach out to the TA and let the TA know that you're in class. And you're going to do that by sending the TA an email. And the subject line of the email, of course, is going to have the word of the day on it, which in this case, of course, is cupcake. And when the TA gets your email with the word of the day, the TA is going to know that you were actually in class today. And the TA will give you credit for showing up for class, which is a good thing. I think it makes everybody very happy. So remember, you're on the hook for sending the TA an email with a subject line that says cupcake. And when you know do that, the TA will know that you were in class. You have a secondary piece of homework. OK, remember, you need to send me, Dr. Anderson, an email. The email needs to have a subject line that says CDA 3201 contact information. And inside the email, I need to have three pieces of information from you. One, your name two, your email address, and three, your mobile phone number. And it'll go into my gigantic record keeping system. And if you banish on me or ghost me, we will reach out and we will find you. Ah, whatever did we cover today? Well, we covered an introduction to the class. Woohoo! We covered a history of computing. We talked about digital systems. And then we focused on some computer hardware. All right. All right, that was a pretty that was a pretty good start, pretty good kickoff to the class. Are we all done? Is that it? Nope. What are we going to cover next time? Oh my god, really? We'll go over number systems, Boolean algebra, switching functions, switching circuits, analysis of combinational circuits, and oh my gosh, synthesis of combinational logic circuits. All in one class. Now remember, careful. I sort of think this is all stuff you guys have covered before. But we're going to make sure that you understand it because we'll spend some time next class going over it, just making sure that it's all clear in your brain before we jump into the brand new stuff. That's it for today. We be done. So. We're done with class for today, and my question to you is, of course, do you have any questions for me? Well, somebody did an excellent job in delivering an excellent class if there are no questions. I am extremely proud of myself. All right, guys, going once. Uh, I have a question. Well, let's hear what your question is. Uh, isn't the lecture like a two hour lecture? It is generally a two hour lecture, and trust me, you're going to get some two hour lectures. I'm starting off slowly so that I don't scare you away from the class. Have you been scared away from the class? <laughs> Not yet, but I'm getting. <laughs> yeah, OK. So I've been successful. And once again, I'm very proud of myself. There will be some longer classes, OK? But I didn't want to hit you with too much on the first day, OK? You Got will it. get your money's worth, I promise you. Thank you. Okay. All right, good question. Thank you very much for asking. Are there any other questions for me? Um, where do we find the recordings for the lecture we just had? Well, that's a good question. So here's the way it should work. I should post them both on Canvas and on Teams, but I want to give you a little cautionary note. They seem to have changed things, and I'm not 100% certain where the recordings are going. I'm currently in the process of working with IT to hunt them down, so I apologize. There might be a little bit of a delay before the recordings get posted because they no longer send it to me in the email anymore. It used to be streamed, but I think they've switched to a new system. OK, so I will snag them and I will post them both in Canvas and on Teams once I get my hands on them. OK, 
So give me a little bit of time to figure out how that's working, but it will be made available to you. That sound like a good deal? This would be a good time for you to say yes. Oh, th thank you. Sorry. I, there, I, I, that's, I that's what I needed to hear. All right, that's good. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions for me today? Yeah. Go ahead. Um. So like, I know you said we had to be in the class each session, but say we were like going on vacation or something a certain day, would we just like let you know ahead of time? Well, I mean, like take your laptop, right? Uh, you can be someplace without like, Wi-Fi, like middle of the woods like, or something. Like if that was to happen, or we were like had something like a certain day at that time of class, would we just you like tell to, you and then you gotta get in touch with me beforehand. Okay. Don't be getting in touch with me afterhand and saying, oh, yeah, no, I'm sorry. I slept in. I don't think so, right? Yeah. yeah. All right. But you can also take your laptop along on vacation, right? That's true, yeah. It makes the, and it makes the vacation even sweeter. If you're, like, vacationing, then do some class <laughs> and then vacation afterwards, and then all of a sudden you appreciate the vacation that much more, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, all right. Something I to think. ponder. Something to think about. Okay. Good question, though. Thank you very much for asking. I appreciate it. Are there any other questions? Um, when we email you our email, is it supposed to be our USF one or our personal one? I, dear God in heaven, I do not care about your personal email. I only oh, okay. care about your USF email, okay? Okay. All right. Good question. Thanks for asking. Are there any other questions for me? Going once. Going twice. All right, guys, fantastic. We're done with our first class, and I will see you guys back in class on Thursday. Everyone stay safe, and I will see you then.